Here at her summer retreat in Vail, Colorado, Shelley is hosting children from the Dancing into the Future project she initiated. It's a typical post-retirement day for the 80-year-old, who is always willing to take on things most others of her age would avoid, such as hiking and singing and dancing. Hello and welcome to this edition of Icon. I'm Chi Xiao Jun, and joining us today in the studio is the Icon of the day, Shirley Young. Welcome to the program. Welcome to Icon. Lovely to be here. Well, actually, I've been wondering、uh, your title. I mean, because you have different positions, different roles <laughs> to play in your life. And how shall I introduce you? Are you the former vice president of General Motors, <laughs> or are you? Basically, a cultural ambassador. What do you see yourself as now? Well, it's it's a matter of when you're talking about, right? <laughs> If you talk about now,、yeah. yes. What I'm doing is primarily cultural exchange work.、Yeah. Talking about maybe 15 years ago, I was primarily General Motors off officer. If you talk about before that, I was a marketing and brand person in、and、the advertising, advertising business,、yeah. right? So a different time. And then you know, I was a mother of three boys, and so different periods of time <laughs> makes life interesting. We, we <laughs> may start. We may start with your title, your position as the daughter of this legendary <laughs> woman. You know, this is the book of your mother,、yes. and she. Well, it's in, 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 we, we do have the English version over here. Which is coming out in、uh, August. In so the Chinese version is already out. Is out, right? Yeah, it's one hundred and nine spring times my story.、Right. Well, your your mother is a hundred going to be a hundred and ten this wow. year. Wow! Wow! Wow!、So. Shirley is the second daughter of Juliana Ku or Madame Ku as she is known. Juliana was born into a famous and wealthy family, spending her younger days living the high life of a socialite in Shanghai. She married a Chinese diplomat, Clarence Quanzhen Yang, and the couple and their three daughters moved to Manila to serve his diplomatic tenure. But Shirley's father was secretly executed by the Japanese invaders during the Second World War. The mother Juliana moved to the U.S. after the war, remarrying to a prominent diplomat, Wellington Ku, also known by his Chinese name Gu Weijun. First nation to be attacked, Dr. Wellington Ku, who was a participant in founding the League of Nations and the United Nations, serving as China's signatory of the UN Charter. He died in 1985 at the age of 97. Madame Ku is still living in New York. And approaching her 110th birthday. You never wore American clothes, Camille. <laughs> That Chinese-style elegance was kind of in her blood, and then she was trying to put that actually in your life too. Right, but she was a, not a tiger mom. And I saw a newspaper somewhere talking about a panda mom. Well, she really did not. She was not very directive. Okay. Uh, not at all. So we don't have memories of her saying, "You have to do this. You cannot do this. You must come back." And so on. no real rules. But somehow, we kind of understood we're supposed to act kind of in a good way. So when we used to go out when we were teenagers on a date in America, you know, a lot of our friends they would say,、oh, "I have to go home at eleven o'clock. If I don't, my mother's going to kill me." You know. Well, we never had a deadline. We just could come home at two o'clock. It was fine. <laughs> She trusted us. She、yeah. trusted us. You know. So, in in as a result, we were really, you know, kind of good. <laughs> But her influence is on you from every aspect, I right, guess. Right. My mother, although she was not a career woman, although、mm -hmm. she had a job at the United Nations, she really was a very great kind of leader in the sense of leading the family, leading her friends,、uh, on a private basis, you know, personal basis, not professional basis.、Mm. So, somebody made a comment that this is an ordinary woman. Who led an extraordinary life, and that's really, I think, quite true of her. She's always been very modest. She never says, you know, she never standing out in front of a big audience or anything like that.、Mm. But she had enormous influence on us, just through her example and kind of just the way you just felt that's what she would want. The best example of what happened was that when the wars took place, 
and all the consular in, on the consular officials, including my father, were executed by the Japanese. So there were seven of them. All got executed. All of those families moved into our house, our own private house, which had just three bedrooms. So in each that bedroom, was in the Philippines. In the Philippines, there、mm. were only just there were two families in each bedroom. So in our mother's bedroom, her old bedroom, we had six of us in that bedroom. So every night we had to build cots so we could sleep there. But so what do I mean by leadership? She didn't rule the house, but she had to keep peace with everybody and make everybody feel not too scared and able to continue life and have the children feel confident that they were protected and also manage just our life. So our household, from a very affluent modern environment at that time, 1940s. We had a car. We had a lovely garden with flowers, and we had electricity and all those. We lost all those. We had no more cars, and then we had no more, no more, no more、uh, electricity. We had to use candles and kerosene. We had no more water. We had to build a well,、uh, and our our beautiful garden we had to make into a, a a farm because there was no place to buy things anymore. The whole distribution system collapsed during the war. And so, you know, we made everything. We made our own jiang yu. We made we made our own shoes. We made our own clothes. We we did everything ourselves. So I kind of grew up in this farm environment. Okay.、Mm. Now, from what you describe as a you know Shanghai 小姐 Shanghai you know kind of social、mm. uh, debutante, to go to this kind of background, her leadership was in terms of keeping everybody happy,、uh, confident, safe. Uh, you know, and and that was a very important thing. Now she didn't appoint herself as the head of the household, never,、mm. but just somehow with her presence, she was able to get everybody to get along.、Mm. Which, when it's so crowded, and you had no resources, you can imagine the pressures there were. You know, I mean, in fact, there was one time we saw two of the helpers with knives running after each other because somebody said, "You stole my oil." You know. So, <laughs> You know, I mean that would happen when everybody's scared. She had to make peace, you know? and she had to make peace in all those situations. So that's right. But she's a person who brings people together. There's a chapter in that book、yeah. because she went to work at the United Nations, and the United Nations was in a startup mode. You know, in 1945. 1945 yeah. So you had all these. First of all, things were not that organized. There were no procedures that had all been developed, right? And so you had all these people in her department, the protocol department, from different countries. Russian background, you know, uh, uh, South American background,、yeah. English, all these different cultural people, and all important people, meaning they had, they were quite、uh, well, well, well established before、yeah. they came into this job. Well, suddenly they're in this new department, and of course there was a lot of conflict, cultural conflict, operational conflict, office conflict, all kinds. So she was the peacemaker. You know, somehow she she knew how to make peace in whatever the situation was. So when she left, there's some very interesting letters in there written that, by、yeah. her colleagues saying, "Oh my gosh, since you left, I hate this person, I hate <laughs> that person, etc." Et well, she, in other words, she's a born diplomat.、Then. Absolutely. Maybe Absolutely. that's part of the influence on you that you always <laughs>、right. wanted to be a diplomat right, yourself. Right. Right. Well, I mean, and that was the environment that we grew up in—that we were with all kinds of diplomats. But she was a true diplomat. I mean, without the position. That's、now. right. Those years in the Philippines, and the years, the early years in the United Nations, in her office, and what what is the influence of those years on you personally? Well, I can't tell, but I obviously they affected my perception of the world and what I thought was interesting, what I wanted、mm. to do. Okay.、Mm. So as you know, as as I've often said, from the time I was small, because our whole Everybody in our circle were diplomats.、Uh, so it's only know, natural that you wanted to be a diplomat. Want, yeah, and I would sit around. They'd all be talking, you know, about li- you know international affairs, etc. <laughs> and and so I thought, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be a diplomat. That's a natural thing. And、Except、you were not only just saying it. Well, I mean, I had this in my mind.、Yes. So when I went to college, I did study international economics and history and all this kind of thing. But. But actually, when I graduated, there was no country to be a diplomat. Yeah, things were different. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I was an American citizen. China、mm-hmm. was closed. So anyway, so、mm-hmm. I had to start from scratch from there. Our strategy became not just come in, be a leader, make a lot of money, but let's help China build a modern auto industry. One of the characteristics of my life is I have been an outsider. All my life, trying to become an insider. The fact that I came in 
being who I am, I really like somebody from Mars, okay? Because mm. it really is the basis for success. In other words, I could have the world's brightest ideas, but if he didn't feel comfortable working with me, mm. they would never take place. She is the daughter of the legendary diplomatic family, mother, father, and stepfather. So somebody made a comment that this is an ordinary woman who led an extraordinary life. As a child, she witnessed the atrocities of World War II. All the consular, on the consular officials, including my father, were executed by the Japanese, so there were seven of them. She dreamed of being a diplomat ever since she was a girl. She ended up becoming a successful businesswoman in her capacity as vice president of General Motors and a trailblazer in helping bring a modern auto industry to China. Let's help China build a modern auto industry. After retirement, she devoted herself to cultural exchange between China and the United States, trying to increase understanding between the two countries. One of the characteristics of my life is I've been an outsider all my life, trying to become an insider. Tuning for Shirley Yang's amazing life stories, only on ICON. Coming from a diplomatic family, it was Shirley's childhood dream to become a diplomat herself. Instead, she became a prominent businesswoman, becoming a vice president of U.S. auto giant General Motors. Nevertheless, she still insists she became a de facto diplomat anyway. Bringing General Motors into China in the mid-1990s, when China's modern auto industry was starting from scratch, required a delicate touch. That's the time when the auto industry in China was stopping to have its shape of modern development and basically... Well, it wasn't. I mean, it, it was wasn't happening It yet. was aspiring to that. That's right, and people <laughs> were... Well, people were starting to think possibly maybe in the future we're going to own a car, but not like today, it seems everyone no, has I a think, car. No, no, I don't even think people thought about that because, right. you know, they were making, you know, 600 RMB a, a That's month. True. I mean, That's you know, true. They were not exactly thinking That's about true. buying a car. It must be a very difficult decision-making process. Well, frankly, um, it was the leader of General Motors, Jack Smith, who had the vision that, yes, this market would become something because, frankly, a lot of my colleagues in, in Detroit said, what? You know, they make, what, I don't know, maybe six, seven hundred dollars a year, who's going to, or a thousand dollars a year, who's going to ever buy a car? Forget it, you know. You're wasting your time trying to open that market. Maybe it'll open in 20 years, but not now, okay. So, our working at that time to get this project was, you know, a matter of really understanding the Chinese vision, which is a part of diplomacy, meaning what is the other person thinking? And we understood by talking to the various government leaders, uh, that really they had this vision of building a modern auto industry. Now, actually, we originally didn't realize that. And we had this, we thought, brilliant idea, mm. which was we're going to bring a current plant that was in existence in America and bring that to China, which would be 15 years ahead of what China had. But it would be paid off, it would be inexpensive, it would be tried and true, no risk. You'd know exactly what to do. You could get started right away. So we proposed this to the Chinese, and the Chinese said, well, then we'll always be five or seven years behind everybody. We don't want that. We, don't, we want to be in the front of the class, not in the back of the class. So when we heard that, even though economically, our original idea was a good idea, cheap, fast, you know, well, well tested, the Chinese, was, that was not their aspiration. Mm. So we listened to that, and we understood what they wanted to do was to build a modern auto industry. So our strategy became not just come in, be a leader, make a lot of money, but let's help China build a modern auto industry. So what did that mean? That meant you had to bring the right technology, you had to help figure out how to train people, you had to bring in all the right processes, you had to work slowly to build the infrastructure to build a modern industry as opposed to putting up a plant quick and getting sales out. Mm. Well, when you talk about this story, now it seems straightforward, but <laughs> what was most difficult at, at the time? Well, I mean, first of all, that's not the way American businessmen th thought at that time. So there were a lot of people who said, well, just, you know, give them something and they, they can make money right away. Who doesn't want that? Well, the Chinese didn't want that, okay? <laughs> Which you had so to listen. So different ways of thinking. You had to listen mm. to what they were saying 
to understand that they didn't want to just start making money in two years. Okay? That's diplomacy. Well, that is diplomacy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and were you easily accepted by your colleagues at the time back in America? Yeah. Well, I've said, you know, one of the characteristics of my life is I've been an outsider all my life trying to become an insider. What do you mean by that? And what I mean is, is that I didn't come from inside that culture. Mm. So I was, just as you say, I wasn't the guy, which all the General Motors people were. I wasn't white, okay, the way they were. I didn't come from Middle West, which most of them did. I mean, they couldn't even get over, you live in Manhattan? How is that possible? Okay. <laughs> so in every way, I was an outsider. Mm. So I, when I look back and I say, what was probably the greatest compliment I got? from somebody at General Motors, it was not, oh, you're smart, or oh, you got great ideas, or you did a great project. It was, I was at a, uh, one day I was drinking coffee with one of the, somebody I was meeting with, mm. 7.30 in the morning, which is another culture shock, because in New York, we start work at 9.30, and my commute is 15 minutes. In General Motors, you have to drive maybe an hour to get to work, and it starts at 7.30, okay? Mm. It was terrible, it was dark, okay? Mm. <laughs> anyway, um, I was sitting with this guy, drinking a cup of coffee with him, and he gave me the biggest compliment I had while I was at General Motors. He said, you know what? You're very comfortable to work with. So I think it's the greatest compliment because it really is the basis for success. In other words, I could have the world's brightest ideas, but if he didn't feel comfortable working with me, mm. they would never take place. So I always say, okay, to be successful, think of the three C's. Mm. You need to be competent, obviously. You should have good character, meaning people have to trust you. Okay, that you're not just out for yourself. But the third thing is think about making the other person comfortable with you. Mm. Because if you have new ideas, it may be shaking up that person a little. Mm. And maybe it makes them uncomfortable. You've got to figure out how they can be comfortable with their new ways of thinking. Mm. But even in those years, I mean, after a while, when people got to know you better, then they would say probably, yeah, you're comfortable to work with. But at the same time, the first impression would be, well, this is a uh, Chinese man. <laughs> she is a, you know, on top of us. Basically, she, <laughs> she, she's the leader. And did you, did you also get some strange questions, basically, when you travel in America? How come any questions about your, your background, or questions about, about China, say, at the time? No, maybe not so many people would ask, but you know they're thinking that. <laughs> Who is this person, okay? Mm. And, you know, like, like somebody from the moon, okay? Because particularly <laughs> at General Motors, every, most of the people there had worked there for the last probably 30 years. That's right. So when I, they, they never hired anybody from the outside, okay? They really didn't ever. Most mm. companies do. They never did because they had, when I joined them, I think they had something like um, 600,000 employees. I mean, they mm. didn't need to hire anybody. They were bigger than many, many countries, mm. okay? So the fact that I came in being who I am, I'm really like somebody from Mars, okay? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was quite a challenge because people had never seen, you know, a woman from New York who's Asian, I mean, come on, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our language was common, but we were culturally so distant from each other. So that was a challenge. I mean, I had, and it really just means thinking about what the other person's thinking. Mm -hmm. That's really all, it's a fairly simple thing if you think mm -hmm. that way. So I, I think, you know, that, that's true in probably any collaborative, probably in a marriage too, right? Collaborative uh, activity that you need. You, you have to understand what's the other person want, not just what you want, right? And what you think they should want, maybe they don't want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 9 percent of the ads written by people trying to get voted were about how bad China was and they were going to protect you against China. That's the way to deal with this issue, not getting into political debates or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, to feel a common humanity between each other. Mm -hmm. This gives kids an alternative. Maybe you don't, you're not so good in your math, but you dance well, you can perform well. All of a sudden, you have self-confidence, mm -hmm. and that's hugely important. After she retired from General Motors in 2000, Shirley was even busier, devoting herself to promoting understanding between China and the U.S. She was a founder of the Committee 100, an organization of leading Chinese Americans, and went on to establish the U.S.-China Culture Institute, which has just celebrated its 15th anniversary. Being a great lover of the arts, she believes that culture and education are the transcendental bridges between countries and peoples.
Is it the lack of understanding even still true today? Because, yeah. I mean, yes. people would have that impression, say, you know, we have tens of thousands of people, Chinese people, traveling to yes, America right. to study, yes. not to mention, you know, even bigger number of tourists right. going right. between the two right. countries. Right. And we, we have access to all these blockbusters produced in Hollywood. I mean, people will say, well, we, we, it seems we have all these channels to know each other, to right. understand each other. Right. But is it not enough to no. you? I'll give you a statistic, you know. Uh, the attitudes about American people towards China are somewhat very lacking in, in, in specificity mm. and therefore sometimes negative. So in the last election, we just looked at some statistics, 9% of the ads written by people trying to get voted were about how bad China was and they were going to protect you against China. They're still now, doing the same thing, I guess. <laughs> the, the last election. Yeah. This election, who knows what the number will be, but right. it will be at least 9%, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So people's attitudes about China today, particularly as China rises, are not particularly favorable. Okay? So it's very important to take away the stereotypes of big, scary China that's going to come and eat us up like the big bad bull and take our jobs and take everything away. So I think that we just did a project with a, a school group from uh, Phillips Academy, and it was a very outstanding school. They just sent about 100 kids to China in partnership with Datong High School and, and uh, uh, Song Yankong, the Children's Palace, mm -hmm. to do a big uh, uh, cultural exchange project through music. Well, those kids will never think that Chinese people are bad, you know, fear, fearsome, mm -hmm. uh, trying to take over our lives, because they had a great experience here. They saw kids just like themselves, you know, and so their attitude about China is going to be completely different. So now, right now, they're 18 years old, okay? When they get to 25, they'll still have that attitude. So I think that overall, this kind of relationship, and the arts are the way to do it, because those are touch human beings' feelings and their souls and their hearts. That's the way to deal with this issue, not getting into political debates or what have you, mm -hmm. uh, to make people feel a common humanity between each other. Mm. So how, how do you achieve that? I mean, you, you bring well, so lots of artists. We, well, we do, we do a lot of cultural... Ex I think our artists are great, um, are great ambassadors for mm. us, okay? Uh, Huang Dodo is a great example. The he dancer. Went there. Yeah. yeah, the dancer, and then Liao Sangyun, the singer, and Shen Yang. We have so many, many artists of all different kinds who, are, mm. who have been ambassadors for the Chinese culture. It's just the fact they look Chinese. Oh, you know, gee, that's the Chinese doing that. How wonderful. You know, all of a sudden you don't think, oh, those are terrible people. <laughs> mm. And you have a respect for their culture and those people. So I think that's a very important aspect. So I do, I help develop some of the artists. I bring them to the international world, help them get there. And then I, you know, I kind of promote them, etc. And then we, we do some group types of interactions. So those are, I have one project I'll mention. It's called Dancing into the Future. Mm. And this is a project which uses an American form of teaching which uses dance, not to make them ballet dancers, but teaches to give them self-confidence and, and teamwork and, and, a, and a kind of search for excellence. Mm -hmm. And this has been in America for 40 years and it's won all the prize, National Medal of Arts, etc. And I brought this to China, uh, to the Children's Palace in Shanghai mm -hmm. and Minghang County. And they responded tremendously because one problem is that in China the education system is very strong Kids really test well, top of the world, but they have so much pressure. They really don't have a chance. If you're not good in your math and your studies, you kind of really are kind of a terrible person. That's okay. right. So this gives kids an alternative. Maybe you don't, you're not so good in your math, but you dance well, you can perform well. All of a sudden, you have self-confidence, mm. and that's hugely important. And you have imagination, you have freedom to be that. So that, that project now, we've been doing it for our fourth year and it's in Minghang County, and it's with Children's Palace and with National Dance Institute, our organization. And we've had 6,000 children, and just, just two days ago, three kids who've been in this program have now, they, they started at 11 years old, one of them started at 15. One of them now is going to the Aeronautical Engineering College. Another one is a migrant worker's kid. He's going to a high school in, in Wuhan, which is amazing, and another kid, comes from a poor background and he's going to the Shanghai Academy of Dance. So mm. just from these three years, they lived in very tough conditions, you know. Mm. And now they, all of a sudden they have a future. So it's really nice to see how they personally develop through the use of the arts.
Shirley has just celebrated her 80th birthday. She was surrounded by family, friends, and artists who couldn't stop talking about how she has helped them and their best wishes for her. I would say uh, the success I've made in the last seven or eight years, I cannot imagine without her. So she has helped me so much. I'm so fortunate in my life to meet such a wonderful, legendary lady. She is my role model. She is not only a great friend, and she is also like a mother figure. There's nothing else you can ask more of her. I think it's sort of being her is already fantastic. I think she's a wonderful role model for all of us. Best wishes to Shirley, and maybe next time we'll see, see her in the 100th birthday. I, I hope that I can use my mother, who is 109 and a half, almost 110 this year, as my role model. So I hope that I have some years ahead of me to continue this work of bringing China and the United States together through the arts. What is your biggest wish now? Well, I hope my wish simply is that more people will do more in China and the United States. But I also have a very important uh, message to say when you do that, let's say from China to the United States, mm. it's very important to involve China, American organizations as partners. Mm. So that's part of what I've been trying to do. So it's helpful to have an American partner because we can tell you, oh yes, the Metropolitan Museum is important to work with and we can access New York Philharmonic or Lincoln Center or, or the Empire State, to bring those organizations so that they will work with you. Mm. Now, it, there has to be mutual benefit. I mean, they're not going to do something because you want it. That's <laughs> they're right. going to do something because it helps themselves. So again, it takes like diplomacy. It takes understanding what are they trying to do. So in the case, for example, at Lincoln Center and the New York Philharmonic, their goal was to expand their audience. Mm. By, by participating in this activity, they could reach new audiences, and plus they could reach Chinese-American audiences, mm. which they wanted. So it's a win for both parties. You know, the Chinese side gets to present its, its things in a very important venue, but then the partner gets to expand what it wants to do in terms of reaching more people. That's so true. I think that, that the future is good, but right now we have a situation with where many organizations in China have both the desire and the money mm. to go to the West. But sometimes what happens is they go to the West and they rent the place, and especially for performances, but it ends up the audience is all black hairs. So they have not achieved the goal of impacting American society. Frankly, it's a lot harder, right, to do mm. it with them because then you have to find an American partner who wants to do it with you, who then will use their audience for you to show. Well, that takes partnership, which means you can't just say, this is what I want to show. No, you have to say, well, what are you trying to do? What would you like us to show? And work together so that you both benefit and both win. Well, and so I think that's the essence of diplomacy, right? Exactly. Is that both parties can win. So in the end, you are a, a <laughs> diplomat. Well. Now, this is um, the book written by your mother. It's 109, now 110 spring times her story. It's just amazing. And uh, you also have an amazing life. And <laughs> do you also plan to write maybe a book yourself like yes, this one? Yes, yes, I think that's the next step to do. First we have to let her story get out. <laughs> and, and, and the story will be in English, so it'll be uh, published in August in English. Yeah. So that'll be available then. And then when we've done that, then maybe I'll think about my book. <laughs> yeah, when that is out, hope you'll be back again in the studio. <laughs> okay. We can talk about your new book and your more stories. Thank you once again. Okay, Ms. very Yale, nice for coming to you. the studio and sharing your stories. Thank you once again. Thank you okay, for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank nice you. to be here.